Welcome to this edition of Hardman Talks. Uh, my name is Mike Foster and I cover the property sector here at Hardman & Co, along with Mark Thomas, who covers financial companies. Uh, so we're the analysts covering RECI, real estate credit investments. I'm pleased to be joined here today by Ravi Stickney, the managing partner and CIO of Cheney Real Estate, who leads a team of 33 professionals dedicated and focused solely on the European real estate markets, and by Richard Lang, who looks after Recky's day-to-day operations. Uh, they will be making a presentation, and you may or may not have seen that yesterday um, there was the scheduled uh, update uh, with the, um, the March fact sheet and um, a bit of a broader update as well. With that, I'd like to move this along to the presentation by Recky, and I'll hand over to Ravi. Thank you very much, Mike, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. I hope you can hear me just, just fine. So my name is Ravi, and I'm the managing partner and uh, CIO of the real estate business here at Cheney Capital, which is the manager for Recky. I think today we're going to go through what exactly Recky is, uh, what it does, the role it plays um, uh, within the larger Cheney community, i.e. how it's managed, and also what it offers uh, investors in Recky through time, and indeed what it has delivered since its inception back in 2005. Uh, Recky is listed on the London Stock Exchange. Its current net asset value is about 346 million pounds. And on page two, we have a synopsis for what Recky is today. So it's a close-ended investment company. What does it do? It invests solely in real estate-backed loans and credits focused on the Western European real estate markets. Indeed, it's been doing that consistently for quite a few years now. Uh, it is, its objectives are uh, to ensure that it invests in a defensive asset profile, i.e. defensive loans and credits backed by these real estate assets and to ensure that its structural strength is also defensive and by virtue of the two, to then generate income out of its uh, loan books and to distribute the net income of the company to its investors. On the last point, indeed, the company has been distributing roughly 7% on its net assets since October 2013 by way of uh, dividends since then. Recky's NAV is 246 million pounds today. However, Recky is part um, of a much larger family of real estate debt funds that are managed by Cheney Capital. Cheney Capital is a London domiciled um, alternative uh, investment manager. There are roughly 150 people at Cheney. Cheney has been running for more than 20 years now. Of that 156 people, there are roughly about 36 people now dedicated entirely to originating and managing the investments in the real estate debt universe. Overall, Cheney, Cheney manages about 8 billion US dollars in investor money, of which half, around 4 billion US dollars, is now dedicated entirely to real estate, um, real estate credit in Europe. So that is the profile of the manager um, for Recky. The benefit of having a large manager like that sitting with Recky is, um, uh, is manifold. Certainly Recky gets to participate in the large origination platform uh, that Cheney brings in the real estate credit universe. Also crucially, it benefits from the risk management um, and the asset management and the portfolio management um, that the large team here brings to Recky. Indeed, that has borne it out very well throughout multiple crises as we have seen now certainly 2011 2016 brexit and latterly the COVID net crisis that is still ongoing recce has weathered the storms of all of these crises well um as has as has the larger cheney real estate credit uh, business it's worth mentioning that within the um roles that cheney brings uh, everything you'd expect a manager to bring to real estate credit, and that is origination, 
virtually all of the credits that sit within Recky are self-originated, in other words, originated here at Cheney. Origination, legal, closing, a transaction execution, risk management is primary amongst the roles that we perform for Recky, then obviously portfolio management, which ensures that the company can continue to deliver on its um, on its aspirations to, to investors. With that, I think I'll also bear in mind what Recky is not and what it does not do. Recky is not a bridge lender. It doesn't participate in small ticket lending um, to on, on, on short duration, to things such as uh, individual house building or small developments across the country. Um, that is not what it does. Recky sponsors and lends again some of the largest uh, real estate assets across Europe and some of the largest developments and value add schemes across Europe. It lends to some of the biggest sponsors, i.e. private equity developers, operators um, in, in the UK and also in wider Europe. So as I mentioned, Recky invests in bilateral loans. Those are simply uh, loans, mainly senior loans that are made available to real estate projects in the UK and in Western Europe. It also invests in bonds, which are simply loans that are listed on the stock exchange. And that's where it earns income from. So you can see on this page, there are roughly um, 310 million pounds of loans on Recky's balance sheet today, followed by 80 million pounds of loans that have been put on the stock exchange, in other words, bonds, and around 22 million pounds of cash. The loans and the bonds earn income via uh, multiple paths. They would earn typically a fee, an upfront fee, uh, which is also an origination fee that is earned by the company when it makes a loan. There is also a coupon that's attached to uh, most loans. And there's also typically some exit fees and some non-utilization fees that are charged to the borrowers um, of, of, uh, uh, behind these loans. That represents the income of the company. There are also other forms of income, for example, profit and loss that are made on the bonds or indeed against the loans. And also from time to time, Recky may benefit from early repayment fees on the loans and also some profit participations if, if those loans come at profit participations um, and they're in. So those are the sources of income for the company. The company is, uh, does take on some financing. Uh, today, today, that financing sits at about 22% of the net assets of the company. And there, that represents a, uh, a cost to the company. And away from that, there are other costs of running the company, i.e. the total expenses that the company uh, incurs to run its business. Falling out from all of that would then be the net income of the company, as I, as I mentioned. For quite some time now, the company has been paying roughly 7% on its net assets by virtue of the income less the expenses of running the company. I think I'd like to expand a little bit on what exactly the company is investing into, i.e. the meat of what the company does. And with that regard, we'll turn to um, the loan and bond portfolio uh, to give you a good sense of the, the backbone of the company, i.e. what, what uh, Recky does, what it originates, and the risk profile of, um, of its assets. On page nine, we have a snapshot of the current portfolio of the company. I'm just going to explain some of the uh, charts that are here um, uh, so you can understand this better. We produce these reports on a quarterly basis where a lot of depth and analysis presented to investors. So first of all, as I said, the company invests mainly in loans and bonds. And if you look at the top right composition, that is the loans uh, that the company has made uh, broken down by the type of asset that it would uh, lend against, that it lends against. I'm going to briefly um, describe each of those categories to you. However, at the back of this presentation, there is also a glossary that gives you the definition of each of this. The assets that lend against are typically broken down in categories between core, core plus, value add, and development. Um, core income assets are typically assets that are already fully built um, and have the benefit of long income from a strong quality as from a strong tenant uh, sitting in the asset. Core plus is simply an asset that's fully built already 
typically in a good state of repair, however, may have shorter term income that needs some management. A value add and transitional are assets that need some element of refurbishment or repositioning uh, to get them to a state that enables them to be fully leased. Development uh, is an area that um, Reggie participates in um, and would encompass all forms of development. Typically, the loads that um, Reggie would lend against are developments that are already de risked. Uh, if you take a typical development in London, say, um, and you, you, if you imagine a plot of land that's being built on, Reki would not lend against the plot of land that is not already started as development. It typically lends at the stage at which the development is already nearly complete. And what's left to do is the completion of the development, the fit out of the internals, and then the leasing of the asset and the sale of the asset. And we have split out the different types of development lending that Reki uh, is exposed to. Geography, bottom right corner. Uh, Reki's exposure is predominantly in the UK, and that has been the case for quite some time now, albeit uh, since uh, about three to four years ago, Reki has also expanded in France predominantly, but now also in the wider Western European uh, landscape. And finally, by sector, bottom left corner, um, we have given you the sectoral breakdown of uh, Reki's ending exposure mixed use hotels, office, student accommodation, house builders, so on and so forth. Uh, we'll expand a little bit more on the hotel exposure, roughly 13% of Ricky's book, as obviously in, in during the COVID crisis, that asset class uh, would be of um, something that's in the spotlight uh, for Ricky and his investors. Here's a more granular breakdown of the loan book um, that, that Ricky has today. Numbers on top, will show you that the loan book of Reiki is quite granular. There are 29 bilateral loans in, in Reiki today. Fair value of the loans around 310 million pounds. The LTV is important in the fact that the LTV is quite low at 68%. If I just pause and describe what that is, that is a measure of risk. The loan to value simply means the outstanding loan balance set against the value of the asset today. Typically for new loans that are entered into, that'll be measured as a loan to cost, i.e. what the balance of the loan is versus how much the asset is being purchased for. The loan book runs at a yield of about 9.2% today on a weighted average basis, and it's alive of just inside two years remaining. The bottom tables give you a further gradual snapshot of that loan uh, risk pro uh, profile. The bottom right box is especially important in that it shows that a large, uh, significant portion of Reki's book is exposed to the senior loan uh, risk profile. And that's important since 2016, uh, Cheney as well as Reki have been moving uh, towards a more senior loan book and away from subordinate positions. There are many reasons for that. Certainly senior loans come with a lower LTV but also senior loans provide with the absolute governance and security package that has indeed kept, kept Reki in good stead during the COVID crisis. So as time goes on since 2016, the book has migrated more towards senior loans. And indeed, if you look at the uh, top 10 positions and indeed the pipeline that's being originated for Reki, it is heavily skewed towards the senior loan risk profile. A couple of things to mention about the loan book. As I mentioned before, um, the loans that Reki extends are not to small developments, or small projects, small assets, are not towards the smaller operators uh, in, in Europe. They are mainly towards larger schemes, larger assets, but crucially towards larger, deeper pocketed borrowers, i.e. the more experienced household name borrowers in the UK and in Europe as well. And that's something that has really benefited Reki, especially during the COVID crisis, in that um, Reki was able to use uh, the fact that it has mainly senior loans and the governance that it has to deal on a very consensual bilateral basis with its strong borrower profile to help them get through the crisis and also simultaneously to de-risk its own position as we went through time. So that characterizes Reki's loan book. Reki also invests in bonds. 
as I mentioned earlier, uh, bonds are nothing other than real estate loans that have been listed on the stock exchange. They come in various formats. A simple loan can be listed, uh, sorry, a simple senior loan or a mezzanine loan can be listed on the exchange. Um, but bonds could also take the form of commercial mortgage-backed securities, CMBS. Uh, CMBS is a fancy word, again, for a loan that's listed on the stock exchange, but may be tranched. So a senior loan may come in tranches, tranche A, B, C, obviously tranche A being more senior, tranche C being the most junior uh, bond therein. But crucially, uh, these listed loans are typically secured by first mortgage security across the board um, and are typically exposed to core income producing assets. So Recky is a bond portfolio of 32 bonds right now, a fair value of 80 million. LTV, again, a defensive LTV profile of roughly 51 and a half percent, duration of about three years, and a yield of 13.9 percent. Now that yield coded is with the benefit of the leverage that Recky uses today against its bond portfolio. The bonds are subject to mark to market. Uh, indeed, they are uh, listed on the stock exchange, and hence, if there are any market movements, the bonds would either benefit or lose uh, with regards to those mark-to-market movements. So even if bonds are marked down, the ultimate recovery on those bonds would typically be from the amortization or repayments uh, on those bonds. Indeed, the, um, some of the uh, NAV declines that Recky had taken during the COVID period was mainly related to the mark-to-market movements on its bond book. And a good portion of that is now being recovered as those bonds pay off or indeed appreciate in price through time. I think I'm gonna pause then, potentially delve deeper into a number of loan profiles to give you a good sense of what exactly a senior loan is, what risk profile it takes on, how it's originated and um, how it's risk managed um, uh, yeah. by, by Cheney and yeah, Recky. So these are live deals, i.e. deals that have only closed recently into Recky's book. I'm going to start with the loan on the far left of this page. This is an office asset in central London, a very well located office asset. This is a core income producing asset in that it is already built to a high specification and indeed it is fully let on a long lease today. So it is income producing uh, today. So you can see it's located in Hoxton in East London. Recky provided a senior loan, so a senior loan which benefits from a first mortgage charge on the asset, and it also benefits from a first chaplage on the borrower's interest in the asset. The LTV, the loan to value of the senior loan provided is 59%. In broad terms, that obviously means that if the asset value were to decline by more than 41 odd percent, then the senior loan may be underwater from a valuation perspective, though not necessarily on a recovery perspective. There are many measures of uh, risk in addition to LTV that can be used. For example, when it comes to fully built offices, grade A offices in London, you would use the metric of potentially pound per square foot capital value. Or you may use the metric of break-even rents i.e. how far do rents have to collapse before um, a lender would be troubled by the profile of the asset. Or finally, you may use break-even yields, i.e. in other words, how high do yields have to go on the asset before you are concerned about this asset. Needless to say, for this asset on all metrics, we are very comfortable with the risk profile of the asset, uh, even in times of crisis as we are in now. Now, the loan, though having a very defensive risk profile, does earn a all-in return that's around 8% today for Recky. To put that in context, uh, before COVID hit, this loan would have attracted rates of about 3 or 4% for a senior loan. Indeed, if I go all the way, way back through time to before Brexit, the loan would have earned about 2.5% in coupon uh, total return for that senior loan risk profile. If you roll back further to pre the um, 2008 crisis, 
loans here on all this asset such as this would have been at LTVs of about 90% or so and earning rates of return of about 1.5%. So indeed the market for senior lending, even on core income uh, assets today has come a long way. There are many reasons for why that is, a lot of which we have spoken to uh, many of you in the past, but the key reason for that is simply that whilst the banks are extremely active in lending to assets such as this prior to the financial crisis of 2008, um, there are severe constraints on the banks to be able to participate in this area of lending uh, since then and certainly on a go forward basis. One of those biggest constraints is certainly regulatory capital and the treatment of regulatory capital as it applies to commercial real estate lending. Uh, it makes it especially punitive for banks to be engaged in commercial real estate lending today. And that remains the case as we go forward. With the withdrawal of banks and also with the lack of meaningful competition uh, for commercial real estate lending, certainly commercial real estate lending, where the, where the loan sizes are larger. Uh, it simply means that um, uh, investors such as Recky are able to benefit from what are attractive rates of return for what are very conservative risk profiles. The second loan is a loan in the middle. And I've chosen this loan because it represents the other end of the risk spectrum in that it is a development loan. Again, it is not a ground up development indeed. A lot of the ground development is already complete by the time that Recky's senior loan uh, will start getting drawn on this particular asset. This asset is in the co-living sector, uh, which is quite simply a uh, asset that's built to be rented. Um, the rents being charged here are affordable uh, for London, and they appeal to a younger um, audience, if you will, in terms of its tenants. The LTV here is also the same as the LTC, in other words, loan to cost going into it. In broad terms, that simply means that the borrower or the sponsor has substantial equity sitting behind Becky's senior loan in this particular development. The scheme here is quite straightforward to bring forward a, um, a, uh, a, a high quality asset for affordable rent in, in London. Um, and once it's fully rented, the borrower is most likely to refinance the development loan provided by Recky. The development and the leasing phase should take about three years, at which point you would expect to be repaid in full. Again, for that risk profile, Recky earns a return uh, that is attractive um, uh, for the company and in keeping with the objectives of the company today. So uh, on the following pages, you'll find a number of other examples, but I wanted to use those two examples to present to you some of the risk and return profiles of a typical loan that Recky enters into uh, today and typical loan that sits on Recky's book today as well. Before I delve further into the portfolio of Recky, I want to pause there on the asset side and now turn to the structural side of the company, i.e. How is the company structured? In that regard, we would look at the liabilities of the company. The liabilities of the company are set against the assets of the company. As I mentioned earlier, current liability profile of the company is that it has a uh, leverage of about 22% of its NAV. However, when cash is taken into account, the net effective leverage is roughly 16% of the NAV of the company. The company has a maximum permitted uh, ability for leverage up to 40% of its NAV, though through time that um, limit has rarely ever been touched. So set against the assets and the income of the assets would be the cost of the leverage. And the cost of the leverage today is, is low at about 2.3%. Also to mention that the leverage is quite flexible in that if it is taken off and Recky frequently takes the leverage off uh, when there's spare cash in the balance sheet and you choose to pay down its leverage, it doesn't really incur a penalty um, when it's taken off. So in that regard, it's quite flexible leverage that Recky uses today. And with that, in terms of the asset income and the cost of the leverage, we can then look at the dividend profile of the company. 
And if you were to take a look at the, um, I call it the mathematics of the company, they're fairly straightforward. The company earns a gross income, as you would have seen from the prior pages, of about 10% uh, gross. Its leverage uh, costs uh, are quite low. And if you were to deduct the uh, total expenses of running the company, the administrative expenses, as well as the um, management fees uh, that are paid to the manager, you would circle back to uh, something that's around 7% on the company's net. Now, the net number tends to move around the 7%. Obviously, the more cash that is held on balance sheet, uh, the less the assets are being worked hard to generate that income. Uh, the more that the cash is deployed, the higher that income. Also, in, uh, in, in periods of stress, the company does tend to generate more profits by virtue of um, being able to enter into loans or bonds at discounts to par or at fairly attractive rates of return, thus having a higher return profile on its assets yeah. for periods of time. And hence, for periods of time, the um, yield uh, may be higher than that 7% in math. So as I said, as a ballpark um, for a good number of years right now, the company's been paying roughly 7% of the company's math. So I hope in that regard, there's a clear demonstration of how the asset pool of the company, the risk profile of those assets, the income generation on it, and then taking away the costs and expenses of the company and how that circles back to the um, fairly stable uh, yield of 7% of the company's NAV that has been there for quite some, quite some time. That gives you a good overview of the company. I think I'll spend the remainder of time then uh, delving more into the asset profile of the company to give, give you a very in-depth view of the uh, risk profile that the company sits with today. We have outlined for you the top 10 positions that sit within Recky today. And I'll go through a number of these, not all, but in doing so, hopefully to help you also read this page um, um, as, as we produce this on a quarterly basis. So to take loan number one, the description there is a, a super prime asset, residential and retail in, in Paris. It is perhaps on the best um, uh, street for retail buildings uh, in, in Paris. It's a mixture of very high end residential and retail that make up the building. It is freehold. Uh, Recky's commitment towards this senior loan is 48.9 million pound equivalent. Of course, the loan is done in euros. Um, that's the commitment. However, today, Recky is only funded about 41 million pounds of that exposure. Seeing that it is a senior loan, the next column attached LTV would obviously start at zero because there is no credit or creditor ranking ahead Recky. Yeah, yeah. The detached LTV simply yeah. gives you the uh, LTV at which the last dollar of risk of Recky is exposed to. In broad terms, again, it simply means that uh, the asset value could fall by more than 30 uh, percent before we become concerned about the recovery on this particular senior loan. The loan type is core, um, and that's simply because the asset is income producing. Uh, it's fully tenanted. The, the residential element is also fully tenanted in producing good income. Um, the borrower here has invested a substantial amount of money in the asset. Uh, his business plan is simple, uh, to improve the rental tone across the board on the residential and the retail and to go ahead and refinance the loan when that project is, is done. Given the location of the asset, we've provided some commentary here on all of our loans, but given the location of the asset and given the scarcity of these types of assets, there are multiple bids uh, even today in this environment for the assets substantially ahead of even the equity value of the asset and certainly substantially ahead of the loan balance of the asset. Um, and hence, as we described here, the sponsor is considering an early exit for the loan as he is uh, deeply in the money uh, with profit today. So hopefully that narrative as well as the risk profile gives you a sense that, you know, on, on this particular loan, there are no concerns on the credit profile um, of the asset. Indeed, on all of the top 10, and I'm not gonna go through all top 10, we have no concerns on the credit of, of, this, of this book. Uh, loan number two, similarly, core plus income portfolio. This is a mixed use portfolio. What does that mean? It's a combination typically of assets um, that break between offices, <clears throat> residential, 
And that's a classic uh, mixed use combination with some office mixed in with residential um, uh, in terms of its uh, rental income. Uh, again, a fairly conservative LTV, 58%. Um, and the sponsor here, as the narrative says, has been um, um, very successful in de-risking the position uh, for Recky. And indeed, we would expect this loan to exit ahead of its maturity date with a full repayment for Recky as well. Loans three, four, and five are developments, though just to reiterate when it is development, not ground up development, it's, um, it's typically development that are already uh, de-risked. Um, loan three is a service apartment development in Lisbon, uh, central Lisbon, Portugal. The borrower here is one of the, actually no, it is the largest global private equity uh, real estate firm, uh, which has sunk substantial amount of equity into this deal. Um, the development itself has been slightly delayed due to COVID and people not being able to be on site. However, the, the uh, borrower has to de-risk the loan substantially by paying it down through time and by cash paying it through time as well. Where Recky sits with a LTV of 53%, uh, gives it a very conservative risk profile against the asset. Um, and whilst it's been delayed because of COVID, we'd expect that the loan is repaid on time uh, in about a year and a half from here. Loan four and five are developments again, uh, de-risk developments here. Again, similarly conservative LTVs uh, with experienced uh, borrowers. Loan four being a office uh, development that's already substantially uh, complete. Uh, and is now going through a refitting phase and we'd expect a full exit um, by the end of next year and a partial exit this year. Finally, loan five, a development that uh, has been delayed again due to uh, COVID. However, all of the performance measures that we've held the borrower to have been met in full. And to address the delay due to COVID, the borrower, which again here is a large global sponsor, has injected substantial equity, equity to pay the loan down, loan down uh, in exchange for which we've given the borrower some time to deal with the delays due to COVID. So I hope that snapshot uh, gives you a good way to need, read the narrative um, on, on the loan profile pages and also hopefully gives you an idea of the risk profile of the loans that um, Recky enters into. I think with that, it's possibly a good idea to spend some time on the sector that would be on the top of most people's minds today, which is hotels. Recky does lend, lend to the hotel sector, as, as I mentioned before, um, not a big part of the book is exposed to hotels, roughly 60 odd percent. We, provided full, we provide a full sectoral breakdown uh, on that page. The largest sector is mixed use, followed by uh, hotels and offices, roughly 13% each. So if I were to turn to hotels in particular, 13% of the GAV of the company are exposed to three, uh, mainly three hotel positions. And I will briefly touch on each one of them. They're all three methanine loans secured by core income producing hotels. So none of these are development deals. Prior to COVID, each one of these was extremely well performing hotel deals, again, with substantial amount of equity sitting behind the methanine loans, and again, by large, well-experienced and well-capitalized borrowers. Through time, loans two and three uh, through the COVID period did not pose um, all the borrowers much difficulty. Uh, the LTVs on loan two and three are very low. You'll note they are cut off at 52 LTV. Uh, loan two and three uh, are leisure hotels. Loan two, leisure hotels in some of the best areas in Paris. Loan three is unique. It is possibly some of the best leisure hotel in France uh, today. And the sponsors on both, as I mentioned, are very well experienced and deep pocketed, and they've always kept the loans current and indeed de risked and re paid down the loans through the crisis period. Indeed, in loan two, a number of assets were sold during the COVID period for prices well in advance of the valuations prior to COVID, thus de risking the loan even further. 
So there's very little that we had to do on loans two and three during the COVID period, given the low risk profile and the de-risking that happened in that period. Loan one is a mezzanine loan at a high LTV, 75% going into um, the COVID period. Um, again, a core income producing hotel portfolio, mainly targeting the leisure and travel sector, but located in London. Prior to COVID, the hotels were very well occupied, roughly 95% occupancy and trading well. Uh, with COVID, obviously, the occupancy rates have been quite low, albeit um, we did note that in between the uh, lockdowns, the occupancy rates did ramp up quite quickly in this portfolio. This loan did require some work. Um, and even though uh, Reki is in a mezzanine position here, governance is strong. And so are the control levers that Reki was able to, uh, to use with regards to the borrower group. A consensual restructuring was achieved in 2020, a hugely beneficial one for both the sponsor group, i.e. the borrowers, and also the lenders, all lenders, by virtue that it de-risked the loan with a good capital injection. And in exchange, the borrower is given time to see COVID out. And indeed, the borrower is now has agreed to a further significant capital injection to see out the COVID period, um, uh, which they expect would take another two to three years before occupancy rates resume to where they used to be in 2019. The evidence, though, is that it might be a lot quicker than that. So again, by virtue of the governance and the control that Reki has, along with low LTV, uh, it was able to, along with the other lenders, uh, structure a resolution for the loan that was hugely beneficial to both the borrower as well as to all lenders, including Reki. In summary, the hotel portfolio does not present a, a concern to, uh, to us and to Reki um, today. Okay, just cognizant of time, um, I wanted to pick up on the theme that I've touched upon here repeatedly, which is navigating COVID. Um, as we sit here to, today, obviously the COVID period is still ongoing, uh, though from a real estate's perspective, just leaving Reki aside briefly, from a real estate's perspective, we're noticing a large amount of capital flow, i.e. a large amount of interests from private equity, from operators, developers, pension funds to buy assets, certainly in the UK, but also across Europe. And indeed, a lot of that capital is targeting the leisure and hotel sector, unsurprisingly. Um, a lot of that capital is underwriting a two to three year recovery period from, from the crisis, where occupancies will only recover uh, to pre-COVID levels um, in, in that time frame. And that recovery underwriting uh, informs the entry basis of the valuations of these assets that are being purchased today. Different assets are impacted differently by COVID. The worst impacted sector would be the shopping centers uh, across Europe and certainly the UK. Um, Recky has um, next to no exposure to shopping centers now um, in its portfolio. Uh, that sector has been pretty hard hit by COVID and will take a long time to recover. I've been through hotels. We're seeing the shoot the recovery in the hotel sector now. Uh, offices, uh, in broad terms, really depends on where the office is located and what type of office it is. But we should see some recovery, though a very uneven recovery, uh, which depends entirely on what type of asset and where it's located in terms of offices. So whilst the recovery is especially pronounced, in the, um, in the equity markets for real estate, i.e. a lot of capital uh, coming into the real estate markets today, that recovery is not reflected so much in the real estate lending markets. Indeed, if anything, COVID has pushed out a lot of competition in the market. Um, you would have noted a number of exits from the real estate lending market, even on European operators. Um, during that time, and certainly the banks have withdrawn even further. So whilst there is a growing demand for assets uh, that is not matched by the provision of debt capital against those assets. Why is that important for Reki? It is simply this. To the extent Reki is well capitalized and in a strong structural strength, which it is today, it is able now to go ahead and take advantage of some of those 
uh, inflow or rather demand for debt capital at much more favorable rates, but more importantly than the favorable rates at a consistently low risk profile for the loans that it continues to make. And that is especially important um, for Reiki. So in summary, um, Reiki today um, has weathered the COVID storm very well. It's um, real estate loan and bond book uh, has performed well. There have been some NAV movements, especially for the mark to market on these bond books through time. A lot of that you now is being unwound and recovered through time. But crucially, its structural strength is good. Uh, the cash on its balance sheet and the low amount of leverage that it has. And it positions it well to now join the rest of the Cheney real estate debt family in capturing some of the returns that are coming through from the lending market today. And in that way, Reki is then well positioned to continue its overarching aim, which is to pay a consistent dividend through time to its investors with minimal volatility on the value of its underlying assets. Thank you, Ravi. That was very clear. And I think that one of the clear things is that you're, you're fulfilling a, a gap in the market with the, you know, the banks and other lenders having stepped back. Um, the clear visibility of, of how you get that 7% plus or minus uh, return on, on NAV with pretty low gearing, your, you know, your 16% LTV gearing and the individual projects being pretty lowly geared. We have got a lot of questions. Um, quite a quick one at first, which is pretty straightforward from Andrew. Does Cheney act as investment manager for other trusts or REITs? Good question. No, this is um, the only... Um a list of trust that we um, act as manager for the rest of all private debt funds. And clearly he manages a lot of private debt funds, which, which sort of, I suppose, comes into the next one in how do you deal with uh, non-payments of income? What's the outlook? Do late payments roll up into the amount owed, as in PIC, and how do you deal with that roll up, bringing it back into cash? Non-payment of income. Now, in broad terms, how do you deal with the defaulting lender who has not paid you the income that is due to pay you? And the real answer is that it depends on a case-by-case -case basis. You've got to understand why a borrower has not perhaps made his payments to you as he should have done. In the COVID period, it might mean that there is no income to pay you, in which case there might be a consensual agreement with him. Typically, he pays you down some principal, and in exchange, you might give him some leeway in terms of uh, not paying your income in cash. But the second part of the question, what do you do then? you do not forego that income at all. You would typically roll it up into the loan balance and he still owes you that. So when the day he comes and he sells the assets or refinances it, all of that is made back up to you through time. So you do not lose the compound income. It is just scheduled from cash into uh, deferred, if you will. You uh, mentioned in your presentation, actually, that in periods of stress, you, you can make more profits without taking on more risk by you know, buying some bonds at, at discounts. Uh, can you give any very briefly, you know, examples of, of what you've been doing there recently? If I look back to March, April, May, June last year, primary, um, how do you say, you know, the lack of visibility of what was happening in the crisis, the primary objective of Recky was to defend itself. But once we began to have confidence that the company was in a very strong position, we did indeed buy even some loans, senior loans at uh, discounts to par. Recky did that and also some bonds at discounts to par. Why does that happen? It's simply because if other investors need liquidity quickly, uh, they'll be willing to take some haircut to what are effectively money good positions and you're able to benefit um, from that. But leave aside purchasing loans or bonds at par. This last you know, 15 months has presented Recky with the ability to make loans, the same senior loans, but not at seven, eight percent but indeed, um, some loans even up to 14% for senior loans. Of course, that did not last for long, and um, that 14 odd percent lasted for about a year or so that you could do that. But even now, the rates of return we earn on loans are much higher than they used to be before. In, in the short term, in terms of how the stock market looks at it, and indeed in, in terms of paying on dividends, the mark to market do affect things. Kim asks, um, how much is, is mark to market and how much, you know, rather is that impacted on the NAV? Yes, if um, you look back through time in our reporting, that will give you a very good sense of the reconciliation of it. 
uh, most of the movements down were with regards to mark to market on bond book. There was a fair value uh, mark that we took on, and we disclosed it, uh, all of it. Uh, we took on a UK house building position. Uh, obviously, back in April last year, house building did not seem like a strong position to be in. Uh, as we know today, that's completely different. And so some of that mark would expect, obviously, to come back into the company. Much this is a broader, interesting question, actually, about how would a higher inflation environment, A, change your risks, and B, how might you react to it? I guess the answer is, what sort of high inflation environment would it be? But it's yeah. an interesting point that's on a lot of people's minds with all this money being printed across the world. You've already answered that, Mike. What exactly is causing that inflation? Mm -hmm. So if it is growth that's causing that inflation, that's okay for real estate because you could raise your rent in keeping with that inflation and you're negated to that extent. Um, and that's usually the linkage between inflation and rents. So, you know, the saying usually is that inflationary environment benefits real estate. That's broadly true. If you do get the other extreme stagflation where rates are going up, but uh, growth is plummeting, you have a problem. Now, that's not the case today. The only reason rates are going to go up today is if the global economy is doing okay. So by and large, the asset values should be fine in an inflationary environment there. Um, in terms of the debt, though, Reki's debt is typically of a shorter duration. We don't have 10-year duration debt here. Uh, it's a mixture of fixed and floating rate. However, the duration is important. So to the extent you have inflation going up and interest rates going up, Reki keeps resetting its loans into that rate environment. And by virtue of its fairly short duration book, is protected against that rising inflationary or interest rate environment, if you will. Do you have any maximum and minimum levels for the core, core plus, value add and development? And you know, how might that change under different scenarios? Yes, in broad terms, um, no, we don't look at it that way. Um, though development does present uh, a lower LTV, if you will, where there's development lending, it, it typically is you know, a factor of about 10% or so lower LTV than it might be on core. The constraints on development lending will come from the fact that uh, it is capital intensive and we only have a limited amount of capital, which is why most of the capital recce goes towards the core income lending um, bucket. And there was a, an allied question from Richard on how, how involved you would get in co-investment. Are, are there any examples that you'd like to, to give um, on this co-investment? I think that the point there is, you know, in terms of just understanding a little bit more on, on developments and, and the value add side of things, you know, are you, are you passive or are you actually seeing yourself as a co-investor actively uh, okay. having to do stuff? Okay, sure. So... Look, to the extent we are senior loans, which in almost all developments, we are the senior lender. Um, we are there every month, at least with the borrower. Uh, we act as a co-investor, albeit our risk profile is completely different from the borrower. What does that mean? We have our own development team in-house. We have two actual developers sitting here who build a lot of assets, not for Reki clearly, but for our own private equity funds. We do develop across the UK uh, and also in Europe a lot. Um, in that regard, we always sit alongside our borrowers with our own quantity surveyors, with our own developers, matching our borrowers step by step. And that's for a simple purpose. If the developer does fall over or needs help, we're able to do so as well. So whilst our risk profile is much different from the ours, we sit by their side through all developments. Uh, whilst I do appreciate the generous quarterly dividend, there seems to be great opportunities out there. Would total shareholder returns be boosted by... Um, lowering the dividends and investing more into current opportunities or in is it just increased gearing opportunities first of all thank you for being an investor and second of all thank you for being the only person to ask who has ever asked us if we would look at lowering the dividends to boost the returns <laughs> in broad terms yes it would do simple reason that if you're not paying out the dividend and you're earning 10 percent on your loans you'd much rather put that towards loans however recce is then for goodness, seven, eight years, uh, you know, been paying 7% on its NAV. Investors expect that, and you can clearly afford to do it. Um, so it will continue to do that. So there's an element really of how do you capitalize on, on this current market environment? So on that theme, so Ian um, is saying banks will not be absent forever. And, you know, whether it's the banks or whatever that, you know, how do you lock in the current 
uh, returns. So you talked about it being good that your loans aren't 20 year loans, but actually how do you lock in this current good return environment? Mm. So first of all, I think the banks will be out of the market for quite some time. Um, simple reason, the regulatory environment in Europe, not so much the US, but certainly in Europe is unlikely to favor the banker going forward with regards to commercial real estate lending. It will ask the banker to lend to its individuals, uh, to its corporate, as it needs to do to support the real economy. But real estate lending is not something that the regulators are going to be pushing for. Going forward, they're still scarred by 2008. So I think the banks are not going to be there for a very long time yet. So we don't see the opportunity set, if you will, uh, going away from us. To lock it in, though, our loans do have prepayment lockouts. Every time we do make a loan, it's sitting there with you know, typically a two or three year prepayment lockout, if you will, from early repayments um, on, on, on the loans. I think it's quite a quick one here, really, especially as, as um, the markets are recovering. Uh, from Richard, what reserves do the company have from an income perspective? Obviously, you've been paying you know, uncovered. So. First and foremost, the, um, the nature of the dividends, um, to the extent they're uncovered, they are for short periods of time. Um, and they do tend to catch up over a longer time frame, a year, two years. We do make it up in terms of the total coverage on the dividends over a longer time frame. To the extent there are markdowns on the book, if the loans are able to recover past through time, by definition, you'll get it all back. So let's say you drop a loan valuation from par to 90 cents, but it repays you in the end, uh, you will get it back. And by definition, as you're seeing right now, the dividend will not be seven, it will be eight, nine percent on there for a period of time to then rebalance the, um, uh, how do you say, the overpayment of dividend from, from that income through time. So if I look at it over a period of time, uh, it will be covered insofar as the mark to market or NAF declines are not realized. Um, just to, uh, your expertise in the market, do you have any view on commercial property and particularly office property valuations and risks going from here? And perhaps if we just look at the UK in particular. Sure. Uh, as I mentioned before, it depends on what type of office. I we, we do have a house view. It might be different from a lot of the uh, office reads, so slightly controversial, I beg your pardon. Uh, I'm fairly um, negative on tall tower blocks in yeah. city centers. Why? It's not so much COVID at all. It's to do with the fact that they're quite cramped in terms of the accommodation they provide. And it's more a lifestyle change that has been actually happening for quite some time now, where employees do want more space, do want uh, less commutes, do want to be closer to green open spaces, do not want to be crammed in and traveling for hours in crowd, crowded commuter trains. And hence, I think the city center tower offices are exposed. Again, not for COVID, but for changes in lifestyle. Contrast, the offices that do offer a very good uh, quality of work, uh, working life in the right area, low density, uh, offices will certainly benefit. There's not very much of them of a grade A quality, and they're certainly already in high demand. So I think my view is, you know, city center tower blocks, uh, the losses in terms of values that we've seen recently are probably here to stay. And I do not see big rental um, recovery in that sector. But I'm pretty bullish from, for the more um, low rise, less dense office market. I mean, you're, you're there at the coal face, so it's infinitely more important what you think than what I think. But I mean, I couldn't agree more. And we have seen stats that probably about 30 percent increase in the, you know, you talked about the cramped nature of, of density of, of um, office spaces over the past um, 15 years, 20 years. Um, it's a question you're always going to ask, is, is there a mechanism or what are you looking into in terms of reducing the share price? disparity with the NAV? Sure thing. I mean, I think, first of all, it's, um, I believe we've quite, we've done quite well uh, with regards to that. The gap is, I haven't got my share price up, but it's about six odd percent, I think, to NAV today. And I think uh, if you compare that to the sector, to the extent there is a sector, <laughs> that's done pretty well to date. What are we doing? The primary thing we're doing is, uh, since COVID hit and recognizing that as an absolute priority, closing that gap, to nav the share price. It's a big priority for us. What we did is throw open the doors in terms of transparency to what Recky does. 
I think an analyst outside looking in needs to know exactly what's in the company, what risk they are, uh, can it pay its dividends, and what's coming next. And by doing that, with the uh, significant amount of transparency that we've provided to investors, and also ramping up the number of investor calls and uh, meetings that we've taken on to fully and transparently explain the company, there have been a very good number of new investors that have come into the company over the last six to seven months. And where I'm sitting right now, that's the best thing we can do is explain the company to investors. Look, a 7% dividend on NAV is not to be laughed at in an environment where it's hard to get dividends anywhere. And explaining that that dividend is underpinned by a very solid company and a solid asset base and attracting more investors to the company is the best way to close that NAV gap. I think, unfortunately, uh, you know, it, time's moved on and um, we're, we're an hour in. So I think we've probably got to, to wrap it up here. I mean, clearly, it was very kind of you um, to, to, to share yeah, that with okay, us. So that, that We've seen right. the, um, the update from the company yeah. yesterday, clearly hardening from time to time, which is on you. And we would um, urge uh, all, uh, all, all viewers, all participants to, to have a look at our past research and um, indeed our, our future research. Thank you very much indeed for listening in and participating. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everyone.